if you are following in Chumashim, uh, now would be a good time to uh, open to the chat. I know we asked to read chapter 24, but just open to chapter 23 for one minute. So we'll, we could start there and segue into chapter 24. If you don't have Chumashim, don't worry. I will try and be as descriptive as possible. Ruthie, we good? Yes, thanks. <laughs> okay, you got it. Okay, welcome everybody. Let's do this. Welcome everybody um, to today's class. We're gonna be learning about Rivka. Um, today's class, we're gonna be uh, learning Lelui Nishmato, Hanino Ben Osnat, how we close. And for the Rifua Shalema of Elliot Towel, Eliyahu Ben Klaus. Klaus. I'm sorry? Klaus. 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 Oh, thank you. Uh, Howie Klaus, Hanino Ben Osnat, and Elliot Towel, Eliyahu Ben Ivan Chava. Um, and any donations uh, anybody chooses to um, give, uh, we decided this week we were going to send uh, our collections to Shomrim um, to thank them for all of their help and involvement last week when our community really needed to reach out to them. And so this week um, we're moving on to a new female character. We're going to be moving on to Rivka. And to bring Rivka into the fold, we have to start, I, I want you to be able to place her. I want you to have a context for her. So Chava was the first woman that we um, um, spent time analyzing. Then we moved to Sara, and I'd like to build from one woman to the next. When we left off with Sara last week, we weren't so perfectly excited. We were happy because when we discussed those three crowns, the one of equality, the one of devotion from her husband and the one of childhood, we found that she did get that equality. By the end of her story, God does tell, it's not the end of her story, but the recorded part of her story, God does tell Abraham, everything that your wife Sarah says, listen to her. And that was a very big moment. That was a pivotal turning point in the Torah because we restored the voice of woman from the Chava stage, where God said, because you listened to the voice of your woman, of, of your wife, look what happened. Had we only stopped reading at that point, we would say, it may not be the best advice for husbands to listen to their wives. But here in the Sara story that we discussed last week, we saw there was a reversal and we saw God saying, Abraham, I know you have your qualms and I know you have a difference of opinion, but Sarah is calling the shots right now. And whatever she tells you, you have to listen to. And so possibly in regaining that sense of equality and majesty, regaining that sense of Ha'adam, of humanity that she wears that crown, there seems to be a little bit of a disconnect in the Ha'isha portion, the part where he clings to her, he loves her, he's devoted to her, he's caring for her. We saw that that was one of the weaker parts when they had gone to Egypt and then they had gone to Gerard and he had let her be taken by foreign kings. And so if we're uh, developing a sense of the evolution of woman, we want to start to say that here by Sarah, for sure we claimed two major crowns which were the one of equality was restored and the one of childhood, her chavanis, her ability to be an em kolchai, a mother of all children, that was restored as well. And the reason I gave you that introduction is because moving into the story of Rivka, we're going to notice that we're going to want to pick up that crown. We want for us, the reader, the goal is to be able to balance all three crowns. We don't want to take one at the expense of the other. As a woman, we want to be able to fit into and master the three roles. And 
So one little saving, you know, makes us feel a little better is possibly, I know I told you to read chapter 24, but chapter 23, which starts off the story of Chaye Sarah, it's called the life of Sarah, even though it documents her passing, is that in this, this Chaye Sarah, it actually shows a love, a kindness, a care, and I'm going to use these words, an emotional attachment of Avraham to Sarah, that emotional attachment that we would have liked to have seen earlier, that emotional attachment where he feels her pain, where he should be praying for her to have a child, not just to be satisfied with the fact that he has a child from somebody else, or that he should run and tell her, I just spoke to God and he said, we're gonna have a children. We didn't see that communication taking place earlier, but here when she passes in the Chaye Sarah story, I'm in the beginning of chapter three, we see very, very beautifully and very warmly how I, there's two sides that we see. We see first that Sarah was 127 when she passes, but it says that she passes away in Kiryat Arba, which is Hebron in Eretz Kena'an. And Avraham has to come to her place. In other words, when she passed away, Avraham was not by her side at that point. And he has to come to her and live kota. And he has to literally, he, he mourns her. So in the one sense, they weren't together in their lifetimes at the end. But at the end of that verse, this word leave kota, the fact that he's wailing and he's crying, and now he goes into an entire negotiation to secure a final burial place for her, we start to get the sense that maybe Abraham at this point is trying to crown her with that ha'isha, with that love and devotion that he may not have shown us so early on. And now today, let's go to learn about Rivka. Rivka is a whip. She's really, really super amazing woman. Um, there's not enough, you know, there's, we don't think of her as being this lightning rod, this powerhouse, but she actually is a fabulous, fabulous woman. And she comes and she's sort of uh, fits the bill perfectly. If we want to study women, she has qualities that are going to surpass possibly her own expectations. And therefore, I'm so excited to introduce her to you. So chapter 24 in Bereshit starts that Abraham at this point, he's elderly and God had blessed him with everything. And he comes and he tells his servant, the one who is in charge of his house, to please swear to him. And the way that they swore in those days was they put their hand on the other one's thigh. And he said, I need you to swear by the name of God, the God of the heavens and the God of the earth, that you're not going to take from me a wife from the Canaanite family. Because this is my, um, the population that I am living with in their midst are all Canaanites. And we had learned our first class together when we learned about uh, Ruth and then we learned about Tamad. Marrying the Canaanites was a very big taboo for the Abrahamic family, for the family that's going to establish the seed that's going to continue and bring forth the Jewish nation. Their tendencies, their character traits, there's something, and we've said this also before, I want to make sure that we reiterate that at this point, is that character traits and it's been proven in psychology, which is really a fascinating point. Character traits are something that change a person's genetic makeup. And therefore, character traits are hereditary. My thoughts, I can't transfer those in a hereditary way. But my actions, I can. And I can't stress that point enough because when we do kindness and we do chesed or our fathers or our grandfathers, it is indeed something that we can transfer to the next generation. So I think that's a beautiful point. 
and it's proven to us here so strongly because Avraham wants to make sure that the traits of the Canaanites, which were idol worshippers, which were murderers and thieves, and we see all the other things that happens with them, their traits are uh, something that he doesn't want in our bloodline. So he sends this Eliezer to his family and he says, um, please take a woman from my family, go to Artsi and Moladeti, go to my land, my birthplace, and take a woman from there. In other words, and I think this is the beginning of we should already be prepared for what's going to happen because Avraham is using words like Artsi and Moladeti. In other words, the same way that God told me leave Artsecha and Moladetecha, these are buzzwords, these are hyperlinked words. When he is referencing his land and his birthplace, the text is telling us, the Torah is saying, you know how Avraham was able to leave his family and start a new life? Well, that's what this woman is gonna have to do. It's not gonna just be her character and her chesed, there's gonna have to be within her some type of a, um, motivation to move forward just like I moved forward because we're going to ask her to leave what she knows and go to an unknown place and be with an unknown person. So I'm already being introduced to this woman without ever having met her yet. And so he says, take for me a wife from there. And the servant rightly says, what if the woman doesn't want to come with me to this land? Should I take your son there? And in verse six, Abraham says, please swear to me, be careful. I want to make sure you don't take my son there. The God of the heavens that took me from my father's house and from my birthplace that told me that I will inherit this land, he's going to send his angel before you and you're going to take a woman from there. And if she doesn't want to come and she doesn't want to follow you, then you are scot-free from this swearing that we are making today. Just whatever you do, don't take my son there. And these are also very, there's very important halachic ramifications to what's taking place here because Today, this law is still alive and well. And I, when I used to teach it to the young girls, I made sure to press this point. There's no such thing as forcing a girl to get married. Halachically, Jewish law, the woman must consent to the marriage. If she doesn't consent to the marriage, then the marriage is null and void. The edim and the people performing the marriage are prohibited from doing kiddushin. They're not allowed to get married if she uh, refuses. Again, this is also important because in those days, back in the Mesopotamian era, women didn't have so much of a say. You just saw a woman, the fathers made the deal, and that was the end. You were property, so to speak. But Jewish law here is being established. Abraham doesn't want the Abrahamic line to be formulated or to be uh, built on a foundation of anybody being coerced. And so I needed to just show you what's building up to our getting to meet Rivka. All of these things are in place together. And the servant puts his hand on Abraham's thigh and he swears to him and he takes with him, and this is something else, all of you mother-in-laws out there, I think this is a very important point. If you're sending somebody and you, their job is to bring home a wife for your son, make sure you do not send them empty-handed. When Eliezer goes, look, we easily could have prepared the Swanee back in Canaan, and once she comes, there'll be a beautiful table waiting for her, and then we'll show her all her gifts. That's not how the Torah shows it. It's, so, it's very interesting. I'd like for you to see it in the text so we understand what the um, basis is for it. So the servant takes 10 camels from the camels of his master. In other words, 
Why would he have to take his master's 10 camels? Why would I have to know that? It's not his property. It's not the servant's property. It's the master who is investing in his daughter-in-law-to-be. And he takes them uh, and he gets to the place that he wants to reach, Aram Naharayim, before nightfall. And Le'et Erev, before nightfall. It's the time when the people would come and water their livestock. And this is where the story takes place. Eliezer does something very unusual. This is the first time in text that we see this type of arrangement where he makes a deal, so to speak, with God. And he says, and there's a lot of debate on this deal. Are we allowed to make deals with God? If you do this, then I'll do that. These are important parts of our religion. So he tells God, make it happen for me today. Make a chesed for my master Abraham. And this is going to be the code, so to speak, that Eliezer has with God. In verse 13, he says, I am going to be standing on the edge of the uh, water source and the women are going to come out and they're going to draw water. And may it be the woman that, um, that says, please, no, that I say to, please tip your pitcher so that I may drink. If she says, please drink, and also I will give your camels to drink, that's how I will know that God, you've done chesed with me and I'll be able to fulfill my mission with my master. And sure enough, terem kila, he hasn't even finished speaking and all of a sudden, Rivka Yotzet. I want you to remember this word, Yotzet. She's coming out. The fact that she's coming out, and look, we may be very familiar with women who are shepherdesses. They happen to be the exception and not the rule because we met Moshe met his wife. We know the well is a very, it's the club of the ancient days. That's where everybody meets their spouses. Yosef meets Rachel at the well, Moshe meets Zipporah at the well. We're meeting Rivka here at the well. It's like the water cooler. It's the modern day hangout area where people will have something and, you know, be cooled off and be in a mood to socialize. But it really wasn't so common for women to be the ones that are shepherdessing. I don't know how to conjugate that verb, but they weren't the ones doing that. That was typically work for the men. So when we see here, Rivka Yotzet, I already want you to get a sense that she's our kind of gal. She's not, uh, where would you expect from the past woman, where would you expect the Rivka to be like Sarah was? You remember when the angel said, where's Sarah, your wife? And then what did Abraham answer? Hine ba'ohel. The women were hidden. They were in the tent. They weren't really such outgoing creatures early in the day, but not Rivka. Rivka was out there, and I want you to remember this Yotzet because it's going to come play with another person that's going to be going out also soon. Anyway, and this is very important. If you want to be a sharp textual reader in verse 15, they don't just tell us that she comes out. They, says, they say, she is born to Betuel, who's the son of Milka, who's the wife of Nahor, who's the brother of Abraham, and her pitcher is already perched and waiting on her shoulder. I don't even have to read another word. Whenever anybody in text is introduced with all of these titles and all of this lineage attached to her, um, my Ashkenaz ladies call it yichus, Yehus means who you're connected to. 
So if your son's gonna bring home a girl, they're gonna say it's so-and-so's her father, who's her grandparents, who's her uncle, who's her... If she has, I mean, her resume reads blue blood to us, especially since, what did Abraham ask for? Please go get somebody from my family. And now here's the text telling us that's her. She is exactly your family. We could trace her all the way back to your brothers, your sisters, and everybody else. And so another thing, a perk to add to it is the na'ara is tovat mar emeod. She's beautiful. She's betula. She's never been married before. Ish lo yeda'a, in case betula didn't properly describe the fact that she was a virgin, they're telling that to us here as well, so you could be sure she's pure, physically, blue blood, everything about her. And she comes to the water source, and she fills up her pitcher, she brings it back up, and all of a sudden, the servant in verse 17 runs to greet her. And he says, now, if you'll remember, what was the code? What was the deal he made with God? The deal he made with God was the woman who's going to offer me water. I'm going to ask, may I have some water? That was the script. And she's going to answer, sure, here's some water for you and your camels. And Leah gets so excited from the fact that he found the perfect girl who doesn't know what to do with himself. He just throws the whole script out the window and he runs over to her and he says, please, can I have some water from your pitcher? And she says, sure, my master, drink. And she is very zealous and she's quick. She's, we would say today, she's as shatra as you're going to get. She's quick. She takes down her cod and she gives him to drink. And when he's finished drinking, then she says, there's a tiny little, if you wanted to get her off on a technicality, so to speak, she, she doesn't do exactly like the script had said, where she says, sure, you drink and I'll give you camels. She first gives him to drink, he drinks, then she gives the camels, and she's also very, very, um, I'm going to use these two words on purpose, she's vatimaher vatarot. In verse 20, she's rushing and she's running. There was somebody else who was rushing and running. There was somebody else who's going to leave his birthplace. There was somebody else who was going to do this lech lecha. Do you know who I'm talking about? Somebody else had guests. And when his okay. guests... Yay, thank you, Sally. Why am I stopping to say this? And this is, I think, maybe the point of the whole class. Is because when we're looking for the character traits of the matriarch, we should not put them in a box and say, oh, in what way is she like Sarah? In what way is she like Chava? In what way is she like Chana or Tamar or Esther? No, 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 says the Torah. Don't take the title of Ha'isha, the woman, and only uh, uh, make it exclusive. I'll rephrase it. Don't take your own title as woman and make it exclusive to only other women in the text. Because when we meet Rivka, we may not realize it originally, but you know, we love so much about her. Like Sally said, not because she's like Sarah. Yes, she's going to be like Sarah in many, many ways. But she's also like Avraham. Avraham is bringing for his son Yitzchak, somebody that resembles himself, which is a very interesting concept. You know, they say a lot of times that a boy will bring home somebody that reminds him uh, of his mother or something like that. What's so interesting here is that Yitzchak's persona is not going to be uh, the top going to want or balance well with somebody who's laid back, with somebody who's, there has to be a balance. And so without it realizing, without maybe him even realizing it, what Avraham was asking for was a replica of himself. 
as opposed to asking for a replica of Sarah. What we're going to find in Rivka is we're going to find both. But I want you to see how beautifully both of these, uh, um, um, the matriarch and the patriarch of Abraham and Sarah are going to find their way into the combined Rivka. And so, yes, she runs and she's quick, just like Abraham had been. And Ha'ish Mishta'ela, the man, by the way, his name is no longer the Evid. The na his name is no longer, uh, it never was Eliezer, by the way. That's just in the commentaries. But at this point, what happens, and I, I want to take one more minute to just harp on this. I, I know this is just the introduction for today's class, but these are all important points that I feel you need to have as a foundation. The Evid of Avraham, when she steps up to the plate and she becomes so much more than just this little betula na'ara young girl, and she's behaving like a matriarch and a patriarch all in one, what happens to everybody in her orbit? Everybody else becomes better than themselves. They become their greatest selves too. So when we rise to an occasion, we actually have the ability to take somebody who's an Evid and rename him as an Ish. Even the Evid becomes an anybody. And why am I saying this? Is because we're going to see moving forward that anybody who encounters Rivka, anybody who finds themselves in her presence is going to be asked or forced or uh, um, naturally become their best selves. And so now he is an Ish. And okay, we had said we never finished talking about the Swani. So it came right back here in verse 22. As soon as the camels finished drinking, this Ish takes a gold ring and they tell us how much it weighed and two bracelets and how much those 10 mashkilim the weight of the bracelets. You know, they say if, you, if she would wear it in the pool, she'd sink. It, they were heavy gold bracelets. And in those days, they wore nezamim, which were gold nose rings. He's giving her and showering her with gifts. And here's the clincher before she even agreed to be the wife for Yitzchak. We're going to see, they're going to go through a whole formal process asking her if she agrees to the marriage. At this point, she's already showered with the gifts. And he asks her. Uh, Vivian. Yes. He also gives her the, the gifts before he knows who she is. Then yeah, thank you. So I, I think that's, I, look, I don't know if today you want to do that so quickly because today's a different story, but there's something to be said. Look, in, in this day and age, we tend to be very, very, harsh on materialism and we tend, tend to talk down all of those things but the truth of the matter is he wanted to show her that he is representing a person with means nothing wrong with wanting somebody who's going to take care of you maybe she doesn't want to be uh, bringing water for the uh, sheep every for the rest of her life this again if you don't see it in the Torah, it's very easy to bash and say, oh, marry for love and all of these things, which you should. But there is a pragmatic, and I'm saying this, and I know I'm being recorded, but I'm still going to say this. Women and men need to know what they're getting themselves into. And there's nothing wrong with for instance, the Evid saying, this is what you're buying into. And it takes away the surprises or the disappointments for later on. Yes, there must be love. This shouldn't be the only reason. But we're talking Mesopotamian, ancient Israel. And this was a practice that was done then. So just take it and, and interpret it as you will. But like Ruthie is saying, these gifts came even before he knew her name. Now, 
We can go into a whole story and say, yeah, he involved God. He had a prophetic vision. You could tell me what you want. But the truth is, if he knew who she was, he wouldn't have to ask the question, but me at, whose daughter are you? Please tell me, does your father have room in his house for me to sleep? And then she says the magic words, thank God, because otherwise we would have been out two bracelets and a nose ring. So thank God, she says, I am the daughter of Betuel. And this is etiquette, by the way. If we're going to learn one, we'll learn the other. Etiquette is if they ask you two questions, you answer the first one first and you ask, answer the second question second. It's don't ask me why, but a lot of people, when they want to uh, interview, let's just say a Talmid Chacham to see if he's uh, right for a yeshiva or even right for a job or anything, they'll very often ask two questions. And the proper etiquette, it's easier to answer the last question first because that's the one that's mostly in your head. But etiquette according to Torah is you answer the first question first, which she does. She says, I'm the daughter of Betuel, and, uh, the, which is the, um, who is the son of Milcah that gave birth to Nahor. She gives her whole lineage. And she says, secondly, yes, sure, there's place for us to sleep. And we even have some straw and it'll be something comfortable. Vayikot ha'ish, and so this man, and he's going to be called the man, he starts out as the servant, the whole time that he's interacting with Rivka and negotiating on behalf of his master, he is an ish. We should just mention that an ish in Torah doesn't just mean a man, it means a man of stature and import. So here he has a status, he bows down, and he literally bows down to the Yud Kevavke, to the God who's capable of making the natural world a place where even miracles and supernatural things could happen. And all that's being said just by the use of the language. And he makes, and he makes an exclamation. He exclaims, Baruch Hashem Adonai Avraham, blessed be the God of my master Avraham, that he didn't forsake his chesed or his emet from his master, and he said, Anochi bederech nachani Hashem, look how God has driven me or, or um, uh, uh, directed me to the house of the brother of my master. And here we have again, I want you to get a sense of movement. The Torah says a lot of things in simple verbs, when it says, she runs home. This is the teenager who's blushing, who's running home to tell her mother who she just met. She is all gushing and excited. And she says, she tells all these things. And Rivka has a brother. And of course, they're going to mention his brother here because he's going to really take the reins when it comes to the negotiation. And his brother, her brother is Lavan, and he comes to the water to see what's going on. And the commentaries say here, of course, what did he smell right away? He sniffed the money. He sees this sister of his coming home with bracelets and a nose ring from somebody that she met 10 seconds ago. And he's figuring with his smoke, there's more smoke <laughs> or fire. Let me see. Let me, maybe there's something in it for me. Maybe I'll offer him something and he'll tip me big time. I don't know. So Lord Lavan goes and he wants to see what the story is. And it says when he sees the nose ring and the bracelets on the hand of his sister and he hears everything his sister said, he runs and he goes where the camels are. And um, he's now being extra nice, please come, Baruch Hashem. He knows that this is a family that uses God's name. So why would you stand outside? Please come inside. And he brings him inside and they give him straw and water and uh, water to wash their feet with. I'm on verse 33, if you're following along, he puts in front of him food and the Evid of Avraham, now his name switches because now he's not in the presence of Yuvka. Again, 
back then, the negotiation was done amongst the men. And amongst the men, he's reduced to being an Evid again. And he says, I'm the Evid of Abraham. I, I know my place. And he says, Hashem blessed my master with plenty. Again, you know, in certain countries, this is still a practice where uh, um, before two people are going to get engaged, there's a negotiation that is made and everybody puts their cards on the table. And here he's saying, my master was blessed. He's very great. Gadol, big means uh, wealthy. And he has son and he has bakad and he has kesev. He's not bragging. This is full disclosure. This is what he has. And he has maid servants and he has camels and he has donkeys. And his wife, Sarah, only had this one child. So in case he's doing the math and seeing how many slices the pie has to become. So here he's saying, guess what? And all this can be yours. And your daughter is going to be married to his only son because she, he only had this son from his daughter, Sarah, when he got older. And by ten law, et kol asher law, in case you want to know how the will reads, he's giving him everything that belongs to him. Vayashpi'eni adoni, and my master made me swear to say, don't take a woman from the Canaanite women that my, uh, you know, that, that, that I live amongst. Just only go to my family. And now for the sake of time, we're going to skip the rest of this chapter because it's mostly a repetition. And very rare do we see in text where um, Mar, very rare do we see in text where the um, story is repeated again in such detail. And all of that takes place uh, towards the rest of the uh, chapter. And now I want to take us to, um, I want to take us to verse 50. Let's go to verse 50. Uh, at, by the time we get to verse 50, he had already restated the whole story that had taken place. And he says, and now, it actually, verse 49, if you'll do chesed and emet with my master, let me know. And if not, then I'll be on my way. And Lavan and Betuel in verse 50, Lavan is the son, and Betuel is the father. And that right there is telling us that all the etiquettes that Rivka had, she sort of picked them up on her own because the etiquette, anybody knows this, again, in any society, ancient or modern, where the father is present, the son doesn't speak before the father. The father is the one that has the priority that's given the kavod. And here we start to meet Lavan. We're going to know a lot more about him the next time we meet him. He's going to be the father of Rachel and Leah, the next two imahot, but look at his behavior. It says that Lavan answers in front of his father, Betuel, and together they say, this is a divine uh, occurrence. We can't, uh, um, we can't deny that. We can't speak bad. We can't speak good. Here, take Rivka, kach valech. These are very harsh words. They look beautiful. It looks like Eliezer is doing a little jig and excited that, yay, I'm getting to bring Rivka home. But when they say, Hine Rivka, kach valech, where have we seen those words? Hine somebody, kach valech, same exact words. When Pharaoh is going to give back Sarah, he says, Hine ishtecha, kach valech, take her and leave. It, it's, it's, uh, uh, goodbye and good riddance. It's not nice language. It may seem from the maybe English and the English it'll say, here she is, take her and go. It's not nice language. And it says, let her be a wife for the son of your master, just as God had spoken. When Evid Abraham hears their words, he bows down and he brings out 
more gold and more silver and clothing. And he gives all this other stuff to Rivka. So there's two courtings. The one where he hopes that she's going to become the wife and then the one that she gets once she agrees to the marriage. But she didn't agree to the marriage yet. So you'll notice. So they eat and they sleep and they wake up and the next day when he wants to leave, the family says, you know what? Let her stay with us. Yamim or Asod. You know what Yamim are in text? Yamim are years. Let us stay with us a couple of years or even 10. And then you'll go. Stay. What do you, what's the rush? Stay 10 years. I'm being sarcastic, but that's what the Torah is saying. And they, he says, please don't delay me. I need to go back to my master. And this is where they do the right thing. In verse um, 54, they say, okay, let's call the Ne'ara, let's call her and let's ask her what she thinks, what her opinion is. This is where the halacha comes from. They call Rivka, imagine the Torah that doesn't waste not a letter, not a syllable, not a nothing, is going through this whole process for us, expressing for us how the transaction went down. And how it went down is they nish ala et piha. We want to hear it from her mouth. So they call Rivka and they ask her, imagine this whole piece is recorded here. Will you go with this man? She says, Elech. When she says these words, Elech, we're hearing 1000% the Avraham, I will go. And they send Rivka. And in case we weren't hearing the Abrahamic patriarchal um, winds moving here, when they send Rivka, their sister, they also send her maidservant, her, her nurse with her, and they send Eliezer, of course, but they give her a blessing. And I want you to see the blessing in verse 60 and tell me if it rings familiar. It's an unusual blessing. They bless Rivka and they say, you're our sister. May you be plentiful, like a thousandfold. And then they tell her this strange thing. And they say, Virash Zarech et Sha'ar Son Av. And may your seeds inherit the gates of their enemy. Where have we seen this blessing of the um, generations, future generations, inheriting the gates of their enemies? If you'll turn to chapter 22 and you see verse 17, you'll see that God blesses that you should be many and plentiful. Who's he blessing? Abraham. And when's he blessing him? After the almost Akedah of Yitzchak, after Yitzchak was almost sacrificed. And the blessing that he gets is, they should be like the stars in the sky and the sand on the earth. And then we see these words, V'yirash zar'acha et sha'ad oivav. And your children, your future generations, should be able to inherit the gates of their enemies. Very unusual language that we've had. Excuse me one second. Sorry about that, just a little background noise. Um, and so we're gonna move forward with this. But I wanted you to start to get a sense of how the Torah is establishing Rivka. Now is where it gets exciting. We wanna see how she interacts with Yitzchak. So up until now, she's been the mover, she's been the shaker, she's been the decider, She's coming, she's going, she's running, she's fast. Vatakom. 
enjoy these words because we're not going to see that much of her in a while doing these things. Verse 61, Rivka arises and she takes her maid, uh, ladies uh, in waiting with her. She hops onto the camels and she's following the Ish, this man. And this man now in the same verse that he's called a man, he is now going to also be called a servant. And I'll just say this, the further he is away from Abraham and the further he is away from Yitzchak, Eliezer is his own person and he is acting on their behalf. And so since he's charged with their mission, he jumps into the role of being an Ish. But now as we start to get closer to home, all of those um, honors that he had uh, on their behalf are now starting to fade away and he's becoming an avid. And I think it's important for us to see that because as Eliezer goes from being an Ish to being an avid, we're going to see as well a transformation in Rivka. She's going to go from this lightning rod, motivated woman who has her own voice. She says, she makes her decisions. She has all of this going for her. All of a sudden, in the next three verses, we're not going to recognize her. But don't worry, she's going to re-emerge. But for now, I just like for you to see, and maybe I'll take one more second to say this. The idea of woman coming into her own is not something that is static and constant. It's dynamic. Sometimes we uh, are uh, external and we are, um, it's a yin and yang. Sometimes we expand, sometimes we contract. Part of the beauty and part of the um, genius that women need to be able to uh, balance is when to expand, when to contract, when to wear one crown, when to wear the other. Maybe we wear all three crowns one day, maybe two another day. This is one of the beautiful traits that Rivka has, because there are some people who are very self-assured and they know how to speak and they're out there. But then when it comes, there's a time to be out there and then there's a time to be a little more reserved and know your place. And this is Rivka. So I don't, I, I see it to her credit that she's able to go from the top of the camel, literally, if you don't already know the story, then you're in for a surprise. She's able to go from the top of the camel, that's where she is in verse 61. She's riding above the camels. She's following the man and the servant takes Rivka and they go on their way. They start their journey. Ve'Yitzchak, and now we're reintroduced to Yitzchak. Where has he been all along? So some people say that he was in a yeshiva, he was learning, wherever it was that he was all of this time, it says, Ba Mibo. He was sort of coming from going. It sounds like he may not have had a very clear direction. He was either going back and forth, Be'er Lechai Ro'i, that place that he was going back and forth from, ironically, is where Hagar is living. And it could be that he had uh, sympathized with her plight, with her cause. There's so much that we could read into this. But for today, I want to say he was positioned in Eretz HaNegev. He was in the south. And Yitzchak had gone in verse 63, so much is said about this in the commentaries. So the commentaries say that the fact that he had uh, gone out to the Sadeh, the Sadeh is a place of divinity. We've always said that the Sadeh is a place to encounter the divine, to commune with God. And Yitzchak went to do this lif not erev, before evening. And so when you'll read those midrashim that say that shacharit, mincha, and arbit was established by the patriarchs, Abraham woke up in the morning, early in the morning, he saddled his camel, and he went to the Akedah. 
and Yitzchak here now during Mincha time before evening, he is now encountering the divine and he is Lasuach Basadeh. He is communing with God in the uh, late afternoon, so to speak. And we're going to know that Yaakov at night, he's the one who sleeps and has his visions with the famous ladder, Jacob's ladder. So he's the nighttime Arbit is established for him. And even they say that Musaf was established by Yosef. So this is the reference for that. But anyway, he goes out to the Sadeh before evening. And remember I told you, keep your eye on this word vatetze, that Rivka went out, she went out to uh, water, she was the extrovert. Well, now it's vayetze. Now the pendulum is swinging, the balance is shifting, whereas she was the vatetze, now he's the vayetze, he's the one going out. And this is, if you ever wanted to say men will be men, it's right here. Vayisa enav, he lifts up his eyes, and what does he see? He sees camels approaching. And she lifts up her eyes, this is men are from Mars and women are absolutely from Venus. He lifts his eyes up. He sees camels. She uh -huh. lifts her eyes up. And what does she see? She sees Yitzchak. She sees the person. And she falls from the top of her camel. There's so many literary illusions that take place here. The woman who was sitting on top of the camel is now has now literally fallen. Vati pull. She doesn't uh, gracefully uh, dismount the camel. No, she literally plops and falls off of the camel. And there's something to say that there was a suddenness about this. That once it's hot comes on the scene, Rivka is now contracting. Rivka is now in every way, physically, she goes from the top of the camel to the bottom. And she tells the Evid, Miha Ish Halazeh, who is this man who is going in the Sadeh, coming towards us to greet us? And the Evid says, that is uh, my master. And she takes her scarf and she covers herself up. There's a lot to be said. We need to talk about the scarf. We need to talk about the fact that she feels she needs to cover herself up. We need to talk about the fact that a lot of people take this verse and say that this means that when a woman gets married, she has to cover her hair. It doesn't say that she covered her hair. If we look closely, it just said that she covered her. Eitzaif, in Torah, in text, means a veil or a scarf or some type of a fabric covering. Now, if we wanted to turn this into a um, judicial matter and a hire a lawyer to explain to us what this verse means, any lawyer could easily argue that a tsaif as a veil is what she was putting on her self because she was getting married. The whole purpose that she came was to marry this man. And now that she's being introduced and being told that her groom is headed her way, she's putting on her veil. That's one. So I don't know what that has to do with hair covering, but a lot of people source this as a site for that. Another thing could be is that she took her veil, maybe she just partially covered herself because it was a sign of modesty. And perhaps on an emotional level, the Torah is telling us the Rivka that we met at the well that was totally out there is now taking a back seat She's now covering herself up. Again, it's all part of her contracting for allowing Yitzchak to expand. And as we read further, we see this very thing happening. The Eved tells Yitzchak, 
the whole story of what happened. And Yitzchak brings her, this, I think we may have to sort of close the circle with this piece, because this is just part A of Rivka's life, but let's see what happens here. Vayevi'eha Yitzchak ha'ohela, Sara imo. You tell me how you feel about these words. Yitzchak brings her. She is brought. She is taken. She is led, so to speak. This is not something where she is the uh, person who's charged and, and very active. She's being brought. But where is she being brought? To the tent of Sarah his mother. And a lot of people claim at this point that Yitzchak was a mama's boy. He's bringing his wife to the tent of his mother. Is I mean, there's, there are so many psychological ramifications to that. And maybe before you comment, we'll read the rest of the verse. And he takes Rivka and she becomes his Isha. I'd like to say it means wife. We're going to see it means much more than that. So before you make whatever statements you're going to make about the fact that he's bringing her to his mama's, his dead mama's tent, I have to also give you this piece of information so you could have a full opinion. He loves her. This word love is very sparingly used in text. Another place where it's used, which is so unusual, is with um, Achashverosh. He actually loves Esther, which is a very, I'm saying it's unusual, but I did an entire thesis comparing Rivka to Esther. So for me, it's not unusual at all, but it would, it would be something that sparks a whole uh, slew of, of ideas. I mean, I'll just give you one little piece. Rivka and Esther are going to have a ton in common because Esther, we learned, excuse me, Sarah died at 127 years old. And Rivka is taking the place of the woman of 127. And Esther, too, is going to step into the role of Vashti, who was queen over 127 provinces. So these kinds of 127 is an odd number. It's such an arbitrary number. But when we see it in both stories, we start to see that both of these stories are going to play against each other. And I'm giving myself a good idea. Maybe next week, if you decide to meet again, we can really learn about Esther before we continue the Rivka. Or maybe we'll learn about Rivka and Esther together because they both show something tremendous. So before you... Wait, wait, yes. Vivian, it also says, doesn't it also say that Jonathan loved David? Yes. So in, that's a male-male relationship, which is a very also interesting relationship. There's this idea of ahava, this idea of an emotional attachment, an emotional attachment, not a physical attachment. So this emotional attachment is the one we've been seeking from last week. What did I tell you? Sarah, you how about this? I'm going to sit back now. I have my iced coffee right here. I did a lot of work already. I want you now, I just wanted you to have this piece here so that you could analyze what, 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 what is going on? He takes her to the tent of his mother. Yeah. And he marries her and she becomes an Isha and he loves her. But then the verse ends. I have to give you the last piece. So when you make your point, you have all these pieces. By taking her, he becomes comforted oh, no. from his mother's loss. So for him, Rivka's a replacement of Sarah in some way. But for us, I'd like to hear your opinions. How do you read this marriage? So Abraham um, never uh, was, like he, until the end, he wasn't attached to, to Sarah. And over here, it's showing us, by, and he loved her. So he was, from the beginning, he was attached to her. So she was his Isha 
from the beginning that Abraham didn't have with Sarah. And now I want you to add to that. So if she is wearing the crown of Isha, does she have the other two crowns at this point? The one of equality and the one of motherhood? Uh, the equality she had from the beginning of the story of, uh, of her doing and, uh, and expressing and, uh, and accepting. So that's her, uh, you know, the equality one. But uh, at this point, and I want you to make the point, Ruthie, because that's the most important part of today's lesson is she had in the past, she did have that equality crown. But what happens when she puts on the crown of the Isha, where her husband has an emotional attachment to her? At this, in her story, one crown is costing her the other. She's not on the top of the camel, she's on the bottom. She's not exposed anymore, she's covered. She's not even her own self. She's Sarah. If anybody were to psychoanalyze Yitzchak at this point, they would say he married who? Sarah. He married his, his mother. mother. He married he his, his mother. His mother's tent, his mother, his mother, his mother, everything in the one verse of him marrying her, the person who's mentioned the most, more than she is, is the mother. So but what does that mean? Sarah, Imo, Imo, what? He, she did it on purpose. She uh, uh, withdrew to give its heart to go be on a uh, bigger. So, uh, like they say, every uh, after a great man, there is a great woman. Beautiful. So she was the first one. So I'm gonna say this. I don't think it's to her detriment, and I don't hold it against her. I think it's beautiful that she's able to balance so many roles at once. And the reason I could say that with certainty is because you haven't met the Rivka of next week yet. She's going to be a mover and a shaker like you've never seen before. And I'll just give you one little teaser and tell you, should I tell you? <laughs> She's going to be the first woman that God speaks to or that she speaks to God directly. This is not any, this is a big deal. The fact that she's going to initiate a conversation with God and he's going to respond to her in broad daylight. This is not in a dream or in a vision. This is going to be a face-to-face a, a -face conversation that she's going to have with him. And that's going to be a very big deal. So even though at this point we may say, oh yeah, she slipped into the role of obedient wife and she's going to become a Mrs. Uh, whatever, Mrs. Yitzchak, the Torah is saying she is right now at this point, Miss, and there's a time. That's why she said she did it consciously. It's not that she's not that anymore. She just consciously chose to put that hat on. And I think that that's going to be a very, very beautiful character trait that she's going to uh, display for us. And so here, while Yaakov is the one out there and he's by Yetzed, he's engaging with the world, she's okay to be in the Ohel. Literally, where's Sarah? In the Ohel. Where's Rivka? In the Ohel. But in the Ohel doesn't mean that we stuck her in the Ohel, we locked it up and we threw away the key and that's where she's gonna be the rest of her life. There's a time for everything and everything in its proper time. And Sarifka is going to be one of the women who's going to show us how to uh, be able to grasp these roles and wear them with pride and, and uh, heart, sometimes with humility. There's going to be a tremendous balance uh, in, in her lifetime. I would like to suggest um, if anybody wants to prepare for the next class, um, I definitely think that Parashat Toldot, which is chapter 25, it starts in verse 19. Um, I would read all of chapter, I mean the rest of chapter 25. It's just from verses 19 to 34. And if it's okay with everybody, I would very much like to do Megillat Esther together with Rivka 
because these two women, every time we put two women together, if we just study any one woman, it's fantastic. But when we start to study them together, we see a third um, intelligence emerge. We see more information coming out. So my suggestion is, I mean, if you have nothing better to do and you really want to read something over Shabbat, you could revisit Megillat Esther. But if you just read Parashat Toldot and read chapter, um, actually I changed my mind, chapter 25 and chapter 27. I'll just do chapters, the rest of 25 and all of 27. It's not a ton of reading. And again, if you're not prepared, you could still come to class. I'll try and walk you through it uh, with as much detail as possible. So if anybody has any questions, feel free to unmute yourselves or comments. I feel that she was showing her flexibility and a very smart woman or wife in a marriage makes the husband think that he made all the decisions, but she knows. <laughs> He knows Robin, who's the best. I, you know how much I love you, right? I know I pay for you. That's probably the smartest thing that we said all day. The smart woman knows when to let her husband shine, and I think that's an important point. Yes. Okay. Um, so, if that's all we have for today, let me just check the. Uh, I see there's a chat here. While you do that, just remember everyone to Venmo my uh, account if you want uh, to give a donation. Thanks. So the donation this week is going to Shomrim. And just to repeat again, um, we, our learning today was Lilui Nishmato, Howie Klaus, and Hanino, Ben Osnat, and for the Refua Shalema of Elliot Tawel, Eliyahu, Ben Ivan Chava, he should be restored to uh, excellent health. Amen. I love you all. Thank you love for joining. Back. And <laughs> um, hopefully we'll see each other next week. Thank you. Have Thank a you. great, great Thank day. Thank you. Hello? Hi, what's doing? <clears throat> Just, no, how would I see it? Oh, I didn't see. Hold on.